but think about uh, what is the next step for like really mass adoption. It's actually the confirmation by big brands that they are in blockchain and there is no way to go the other way. It's more the direction of how we can apply blockchain technology to secure uh, something that was not secured previously. Um, there are things that, uh, if we are talking about mass adoption, we need to educate people. This is something that being crypto is uh, aiming at, actually. I think all the news, like PayPal going into crypto, Sony and Nike opening their branches dedicated especially to NFTs and crypto, I think all this news... Uh, actually will keep supporting the uh, trend of mass adoption. Let's be yeah. honest. The reason uh, crypto industry thrived during the recent years was uh, easy monetary policy after pandemic time. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to the Hatched Podcast presented by Nest. I know this sounds a little strange not coming from Glyso. She's not with us today, unfortunately, but in her place, we do have a very, very, very special guest. Our guest today is the CEO and founder of one of the largest crypto publications in the world. They reach around 20 million people, are translated into 14 different languages, and have a team of up to 200 people that are experts in their industries. So ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm, warm welcome to Alina from Being in Crypto. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for inviting and I'm happy to join your podcast. Yeah, it should be, it should be a fun one. I'm, I'm a little jealous that you're in Argentina because I've always said when the next bull run ends, that's where I will be heading. <laughs> um, but maybe just to start off, you could help us learn a bit more about your background before crypto. So kind of what you were doing before crypto and anything about those experiences till we touch on maybe the transition point where you shifted your attention? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've been working as a financial analyst focused on fundamental analysis of uh, foreign exchange commodities and uh, stock exchange uh, during uh, more than 10 years. So I've, I was quite a prominent analyst in Russia back then. And um, my specific focus were foreign exchange, so foreign currencies. I forecasted the movements depending on the monetary policy or the central banks. So it's quite obvious that I was one of the first to actually start digging into the concept of the first digital currency. So mm -hmm. that's how I came to know about uh, Bitcoin. Um, initially, I think in 2014, I tried to uh apply the fundamental and technical analysis <laughs> to <a> forecasting <laughs> bitcoin those times but it's like insane it's absolutely not working and it's a whole absolutely different story so yeah and the whole idea regarding uh being crypto was born in 2018 uh, during the ICO boom, if you remember. So uh, I have mm -hmm. I had a friend yep. who worked in a marketing agency who started to dig deeper into ICOs and into PR strategies. So I was just curious watching what she's doing, uh, read some white papers that they got there. And it was kind of insane, but at the same time, fascinating and inspiring. Some of the projects looked like absolutely innovative, uh, looked like they're going to change the world. So it was a very exciting time. But at yeah. the same time, in 2018, uh, I realized some pain points in the industry. I realized with this uh, big potential of many blockchain projects, there was a need of uh, reliable information in the industry. Many small projects were attempting to cash in, in on the booming industry uh, uh, 
it actually led to many scams, misinformation, and chilling around crypto. And I think I had the right background and experience to develop a crypto news media project that could fill this gap. Because previously, I used to work as a fundamental analyst, and I also managed a, a financial magazine. Mm-hmm. And then I managed a newswire uh, dedicated to uh, financial news. So all this in one space actually gave me this advantage of starting the business. And initially, I identified those three areas where the biggest pains of the audience lied. And I do believe that we still have some of those pains right now. So first of all, uh, simplification. Most crypto media aimed at crypto experts and they didn't look accessible to a wider audience. They mm-hmm. created this feeling of this elite circle, which could be joined by geeks only. And mm-hmm. then uh, the second point is trust. It was obvious that anybody could pay money and promote their crypto project without a proper scam check and digging deeper into KYC issues. I remember when we joined, it was like more than 200, maybe even more news media. And they didn't care. They didn't check because nobody knew even how to check this kind of project, you know. And then the third point is fact checking and original reporting, because the whole news media industry of Web3 was evolving from blogs rather than from, you know, traditional uh, media outlets. So those uh, those times, many media uh, wrote stories based on rumors, tweets, random posts without proper fact checking and in many times in a very biased manner. So yeah. in many times they actually mislead, misled people. So this is basically what we focused on from the very beginning on uh, injecting trustworthy information in the area which uh, didn't have any rules those times. I do believe that right now the industry is more mature, but there are still cases. You heard some of them just recently. Do you, so actually on on that point, I think it's an interesting topic because our industry is a very, very financialized industry. I'm curious because our industry is very financialized and people's real money are at stake, both the people in crypto who are experts and the people sitting at home. And I do like what you're saying about, we need honest media, because the stakes are actually higher for people. And I wanted to ask, how difficult is it to do proper due diligence on a project? Because I imagine a lot of these things are, crypto people tend to be good at manipulating and hiding some things sometimes, depending on the project you talk to. And I wonder how difficult is that process to say, okay, this is genuine, this is honest. These guys are trying to take advantage of the system. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, we we do have our own guidelines, you know, Uh, Mm -hmm. we have the list of things that we are checking regarding the companies uh, who want to uh, get promotion with us. And uh, it's obvious that core of our business is advertising as any news media, any uh, news outlet. This is the way we make money. But... um, Partially, just because uh, we have already the brand and authority and we are able to get in touch with uh, the most influential and the biggest players of the uh, industry. So we are able to partner with those who have already built the trust and we know that uh, they're not going to just escape with somebody's money. This is one of the core points. But another one for small projects, for new projects that are joining, we have, uh, we always follow the guidelines, like checking the community, checking the reviews, checking their white papers, checking uh, KYC, who is behind uh, the project. If 
it's uh, nowhere nobody knows who is doing that if there is nothing about the company if it's not clear even where it's registered i can tell you that this is a red flag but so this applies to companies that are looking to advertise primarily right compared to companies that exactly. are having because you might pick up a story exactly. about an anonymous team and write an article about them, but this is like genuine advertising dollars. Yeah, this, this is, is the approach regarding advertising. So if we are writing about somebody on paid basis, I mean, here we also filter. We, we don't take all kinds of money from all kinds of uh, advertisers. Another yeah. point is original reporting and uh, uh, fact checking in use. This is a very important point. It's really hard to do uh, because, you know, you mentioned that we kind of influence the money of our audience. Uh, Google has this point your money, your life. So all the content uh, of your, mile, uh, your money, your life category is scrutinized by Google. So we follow Google guidelines regarding the way we can write about uh, some information. So we never make any opinions. We are always check the information. We check the sources and we write only based on the facts. We are not eligible to write based on rumors. It's um, it's counterproductive and it actually can mislead. And you know, we, the we have enough. Case. I think we have enough ETF. rumors in our space. Absolutely, <laughs> I think we have enough absolutely. rumors in our space. Yeah, but then also because before we kind of dive in a little deeper, I want to take you back a little bit to maybe the start of being in crypto because I know there's a lot of people that listen to this that are either startup founders or aspiring founders, and I wanted to talk about maybe the difficult parts of starting a business, particularly a crypto media publication and those first six months or maybe first year and a half, maybe is there any sort of stories or lessons you could share from that time where things maybe didn't seem so clear about, oh, now we have an established business, but that was the root and the base. And from the time of the building phase, I'm curious about your experiences there. Yeah, absolutely. We have grown so fast and we have come through so many transformations that maybe only now I'm uh, coming to the point of realizing what we have done and <laughs> what a huge company we actually built. Because right now we actually write in 16 languages already. We are the biggest in the world by coverage. And can you imagine there's more than 200 people writing from more than 60 countries in the 16 languages? And we are absolutely remote. We are decentralized. Basically, we do not have any office. Um, and uh, it means that you need to triple your efforts to actually build the alignment between the team to inspire them, not through offline uh, meetings, but actually through online presentations and Slack. And uh, yeah, this is a, a very challenging uh, um, industry and a very ch challenging environment. So I would name maybe two key lessons I learned. So first, a focus on talents. I do believe HR is the king. Even if you have the greatest and the brightest idea and you have the motivation, but if you surround yourself with people who do not share your values or who do not have the needed expertise, uh, you're not going to achieve the goals. You cannot be one man in the bottle, you know. So the way you hire the way you inspire, the way you build connections between departments and teams all over the world, in our case, it's even twice more important in a remote environment. Uh, and the right people in the right place with the right values and commitment will make wonders. This is basically the case with being crypto. During five years, we outperformed more than 200 uh, companies that were much older than us, that who had a great SEO core, you know, uh, that have been writing for quite some time and building the community at the very beginning. But we, we did it with this right approach. 
And the second point I would say, be ready to learn through your life. The world is changing and many things are becoming obsolete, especially in Web3. One day it's uh, uh, ICO. Who remembers about ICO right now? You know, uh, another it's Metaverse, uh, then it's NFTs. And we are moving in cycles. Sometimes it comes back, sometimes it's becoming obsolete. So what is the most important uh, is to be ready to adjust to changes and be flexible with testing all kinds of ideas. There are no mistakes. There are only lessons. And actually, I think that, that is a good point in the sense that we can't get married to any ideas in this space because they change so quickly. And the breadth Absolutely. or the scope of what we're working on is just going to get bigger and bigger. So when we talk about the ICO days, it was an insane time for now looking back it was a very simple feature. It was to, to launch a exactly. token. Exactly. Which now looking exactly. back, so much happened because of that simple feature. But now looking at it, it's quite simple compared to what people are working on today. And so there yeah, is like a crazy time cycle for this industry. And I wonder, when did you see that growth for your company? Was there, was it moments where the reach just scaled and got really large over stories or was it a gradual increase over time? No, we definitely had these moments of our life. First uh, stage, I think, uh, was um, after half a year. I think in the beginning of 2019, uh, we had we got a huge spike from Google. Um, we actually um, the key of our success is uh, organic traffic. So it's not paid, it's not partnerships. It's uh, basically we are right in the way that Google considers it to be a trustworthy information. So I think the first stage was this. Uh, Google appraisal, they, they confirmed that we are relevant and we are writing good mm -hmm. stuff. And then the second stage was the decision of uh, scaling our business to uh, the first five languages, because initially we wrote in English only. And uh, the information, those times, the information, even in English, was really scarce. So we mm -hmm. would we could stick to it. But at that time, we realized that in other languages, it's absolutely non-existent. So the decision to uh, scale it to, I think initially it was uh, German, French, Spanish, Turkish, and Russian. We started with... Um, Spanish first and then scaled it step by step. So yeah, we, we saw that uh, people really need this information. I live in Argentina right now. Uh, not many people speak English, you know, not many people will understand uh, articles in English. They actually need information in their own language. Uh, and Spanish uh, language is one of the most popular in the world. <laughs> How can we, yeah, right now we have uh, uh, Polish, we have Thai, we have uh, Indonesian, Bahasa, mm -hmm. and we are writing in all these languages as well. And it's even less information there. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you see that as maybe, I like to ask people what their 10 year goal or blue sky vision is. Do you think that's part of it is essentially having a media source where regardless of where I am or what language I speak, I can just switch between the languages so that it's not, oh, I need a writer to write a, um, an article in Bahasa or in Mandarin. It's the language, they, all the articles are immediately translatable through all of the different languages. Oh, I think it's the question of uh, one year. You see what's going on with AI right now. Um, of course, the quality is still not at the level. Of course, uh, there are hallucinations uh, in ChatGPT, but um, the speed it's evolving, it will definitely change the whole world of media. And uh, here we need to be careful because fact checking is still the problem oh, there. Yeah. Uh, but with the properly trained system and uh, with the 
properly trained uh, um, team of editors, I think it's absolutely possible. Of course, uh, it could not live without manual reviewers. Uh, mm. We will still need somebody checking if it's the right uh, topic, if it's the right information, if it's the right source. But anyways, I do believe it's absolutely possible. And actually, I want to shift a little bit over to talking about the industry as a whole, because I think we're in a very, very interesting time. Honestly, in the last like two weeks and right now, where a lot of people are talking about, it seems to be the, the starting seeds of a, of a bull market. And I wonder, is that something, do you, do you see that in the data? with like the readers, the topics they're looking at and all these sorts of things that the traffic is going up? Or is this just a narrative that we're making up in Twitter to make ourselves feel better? <laughs> no, I would say that this first uh, positive news, positive seeds of news are uh, coming to the market definitely. And you can see not only by traffic, but also by the... Uh, dynamics of cryptocurrencies, uh, they started to go greener, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> this is one point, but I would not call it a, a crypto spring even. It's just the very, very beginning. And yeah, I would not just the seeds. <laughs> consider it, uh, yeah, I would not consider it something like super stable and long term. But I would say that in uh, 2024, it's going to be changed and we will see crypto spring for sure. And it's based not on good news regarding uh, ETFs or <laughs> Bitcoin halving. This is fundamentally good as well for crypto market. But it also depends on the recovery of the global economy. Let's be yeah. honest. The reason... Uh, crypto industry thrived during the recent years was uh, easy monetary policy after pandemic times. And uh, central banks injected a lot of uh, cheap money into the world economy. And then they got huge inflation and then they started to tighten the monetary policy. And all the money were gone, you know, in one year, we just uh, yeah. were left without VC money, and it means that the development of some of the projects were stopped. And this is the reason what we see right now with cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. So whenever the first decrease of the rate by central banks happen, it That's will be the it's... beginning of the crypto spring. Yeah. yeah, and it's quite it's quite according, actually interesting. According to my estimations, yeah, it's so according you... to my estimations. Yeah, it's gonna be in Q3 of 2024, and it's gonna be done by Federal Reserve. It's quite funny because honestly, what you just said, the Federal Reserve lowering your interest rates, that's the biggest determining factor of whether or not we get this. But we still have a Absolutely. lot of people talking about, no, no, it's the happening. And I'm like, do you think I'm going to tell my friends, hey, guys, the Bitcoin happening is coming. They are going to be like, I don't care. I don't know what that is. But <laughs> when it comes to cheaper if, money if that I can... If you don't have because... money, exactly. If you don't have money, whatever happens in the industry, in the space, it will... Uh, actually influence the opinion only very small uh, amount of people those crypto geeks who really understand what is happening the unfortunately we are right now at the stage when we still working on mass adoption and we are not there in some countries like argentina for example i think it can be around 15 to 20 percent but just because mm -hmm. they actually resolve the pain points of their economy with the help of cryptocurrencies but in many countries over over the world it it doesn't exceed more than i don't know maybe three or five percent so yep. the mass adoption you, is not there i think one of the things that i've seen is even though a lot of the market cycles are driven by rates and by the easiness of getting money, essentially, they also do tend to time up with a use case. So ICOs, NFTs, DeFi, all these things. And I'm curious, 
maybe less so what you think the next use case will be, because I, I don't think that that's, we can understand that at this point, but maybe do you see data about use cases in terms of, oh, real world assets have a general genuine trend line that's going up of interest over the last six months or any sort of use cases that maybe you see as particularly interesting? I do believe that the next stage of the development for uh, Web3 will be not this hype viral topics like NFTs or Metaverse or Gamify. Think about that. Gamify was aimed at a gaming community, NFTs on artistic community, then Metaverse on um gaming artistic community so it's this uh, viral thing but uh, and the the traders community have always been there but think about uh what is the next step for like really mass adoption it's actually the confirmation by big brands that they are in blockchain and there is no way to go the other way you you choose this direction just because of the future and i think all the news like paypal going into crypto sony and nike opening their branches dedicated specially to nfts and crypto i think all this news uh actually will keep supporting the uh, trend of mass adoption it will not be like this viral and immediate but it will be the building of trust from bigger brands i do, do you believe think it actually, that what you think it won't come from within the, the industry you think it come from it'll come from acceptance from the major corporations around the world i do think that we came to this point if you remember dot com boom what was initially like it was super I'm not viral. sure. Everybody I was doing maybe, their business. I might have been one years old, <laughs> so I'm not too sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I was young too. But anyways, <laughs> I read about that, and I do see the you know the trend is kind of the same. So initially, it was the narrow community of uh, technical geeks. So they were developing something. Then immediately it became viral with lots, the, with the easiness of businesses that you can launch. And then it attracted a lot of venture capital money. This is what we saw two years ago, right? And then the, um, the bubble burst. And then after all this, virality step by step the big companies started to realize what's happening and go into the space and then some uh startups the biggest startups started to develop into really mature companies so it's basically the trend of two side two directions the established companies supporting and approving and giving trust and then the big ones that we already have in the space and we do have them will start getting even bigger and start uh, showing even more uh, use cases that are applicable for a traditional business. I think I think that makes sense. It's it's it's. I think a lot of the time we want it to be one or the other. Like, what's the use case? Because a lot of people then will think, oh, what's the okay. use case? Okay, which which tokens exist for that use case? I'll buy it. But it is it's a mixture, right? It's like it's. We need exactly. acceptance, but then we also need development from our side, from the inside. And I wonder, starting a, a crypto publication, I think you, out of most people, get a very interesting look into the space that not a lot of people get because you exactly. get to do due diligence on a lot of companies. You get to see what they actually have when it comes down to it, when they're looking to advertise. And I wonder, are there anything things that you think the general crypto public doesn't know about or doesn't pay attention to that you think is a bigger issue than it is or a bigger part of our space than it is? Because I'm always looking for misalignments of crypto people on Twitter think it's this, but the big companies in the media, they think it's this. And so I'm kind of curious about like that distinction and if there's anything you could share with us about it. Yeah, I'm not sure even if I can share it because it's going to be like, you know, it, it's going to be only my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
maybe it's not going to be confirmed because there is not enough data. I can say that currently, of course, the biggest players are those who focused on trading, and it's obvious because, um, yeah, they have they they are the only one who have viable model, but. Uh, the trend is kind of going into the direction of like real business use cases. It feels like that. Uh, so like resolving the pain points. There are some projects that are working on uh, uh, tokenization of uh, real estate, for example, mm -hmm. which actually combines the idea of digital nomads, freedom, accessibility of uh, very expensive real estate all over the world, and security as well. Uh, so mm -hmm. this is only one of the examples. So for me, it's more the direction of how we can apply blockchain technology to secure uh, something that was not secured previously. Uh, there are things that uh, governments, again, I'm, I'm in touch here in Argentina, I'm in touch with the government and I see their steps. I do think that Argentinian government is the most innovative in the sense of uh, uh, blockchain technology. So, the governments of the com of the countries with a kind of weak emerging economies, they do see the potential uh, of applying this technology uh, for security reasons first, but also for um, f for the reasons of uh, decreasing the costs. Basically, blockchain can decrease significantly bureaucracy and it may basically give the opportunity to new uh, governments to reduce the costs uh, by reducing the people in the state. So it's only like a couple of examples what I see, but let's see what's going to be true. And I agree. I, I, do, I do agree. I think like one thing is that some a lot of countries in the world should crypto develop into what a lot of us think it will will become pretty wealthy because of it and i think those will tend to become tend to be the currently less developed nations because they're going to see the opportunity and want to take the risk compared to a established company or established mm -hmm. country um but actually kind of talking on that that's a good transition to the special segment <laughs> that i didn't want to share with you so the special segment of the show, essentially, we get the previous guest to ask the next guest a question. And so your question is from the head of communications at the Casper Network. And the question for you is, if you had to build an app right now to onboard a million people into crypto, what app do you think would give you the best chance? Okay, that's a tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's an educational app, something like EdTech, uh, but uh, applying all the Web3 advantages. Uh, so it should be gamification, uh, education in a simple way with uh, your personal assistant, maybe based on AI, and with blockchain, uh, with crypto payments inside the app. And in the best case scenario, it should be a web app. It should not be part of Apple and Google environment. <laughs> Actually, I think that's an, I didn't expect ad tech, to be honest. Um, but then if we are talking about mass adoption, we need to educate yeah. people. This is something that being crypto is uh, aiming at, actually. We, we do invest a lot of our efforts and dedicate uh, a lot of our content efforts into education. Yeah, absolutely. And then what would your question for our next guest be? Uh, my question is this. Uh, okay, what is the most inspiring use case of applying blockchain technology in our traditional world you have heard 
off. Okay. Well, that's a good question. Alina, we've come to the end of the podcast. I want to say thank you so much for, for taking the time to be on. I think everyone at home has probably gained a little bit from that. And I really appreciate you sharing your insights. So I just wanted to say thank you. And just to give you a chance to talk to the audience, maybe you could tell them where they could follow you, how they could stay in touch, how they could support you guys. Just want to roll out the red carpet right now so you could share with them. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting. It was a pleasure and a very interesting conversation. Um, so follow us, follow Bean Crypto in your language, uh, in whatever social media you use. We are everywhere. Uh, you can follow me in LinkedIn. It's uh, Alina Vanasiva. And I have my personal account in Instagram where I do not yeah, share I don't think much need, about I don't crypto. Think you need to <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you need to give all these people your personal account. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but you will never see anything about like uh, technology there. So that's <laughs> it. Perfect. Well, Alina, thank you so much, guys. We're going to put all this information in the description below. So please make sure to go follow, support, engage with them. They're a really, really pivotal part of our space. So we appreciate the work they do. And everybody listening at home, that has been another episode of the Hatch Podcast. We appreciate you. Take the time to like, comment, subscribe. Give us some feedback. Let us know what you think. Tell us who you want us to have on. And we will see you guys next time. Take it easy. Thank you. Bye.